Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of the Deen Show. We're here in Medina, out of all places, the beloved home of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we have a special guest. We're going to be talking about the compilation of the Bible. We're going to be talking about uh, who the authors were and some of these other things. I'm sure you're eager to know. And we have our special guest, former Christian minister, preacher, Sheikh Yusuf Estes. You don't want to miss this episode of the Dean Show. Sit tight. We'll be right back. Allah, there's only one God, and Muhammad is his messenger. Allah. Oh, Shaykh, we want to ask you a few questions about the compilation of the Bible. Now, many people assume that Jesus wrote, or his uh, companions wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's start with these four Gospels. Can you tell us who's responsible for writing these four Gospels? Yes, uh, inshallah. First of all, the books that we know today is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In their original compilation, they weren't, they didn't carry these names. They had code names on them. And they were given these names later as a mark of distinction to give sort of a personal touch to the, each of the books. Matthew, they said, was most likely someone who was uh, perhaps a Jew, a tax collector uh, for the Romans or whatever. So they've uh, labeled him as Matthias or Matthew. They bring it as Matthew when they come to English. And Luke, they said, was possibly a doctor, something like this, called him Lucas. We call him in English Luke. Mark, this is based on one, a much older gospel, which is called Q. It still maintains the original codex that it had of Q. And then the last one is the Johann gospel. And none of these were from the same time period. If you look to the Johann Gospel, you're talking about something that came much later and uh, had a, a totally different flavor to it, if you will, so much so that it is not considered as a part of the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are considered to be the synoptic Gospels because they follow the synopsis the same way, whereas the Johann Gospel doesn't. As far as any authenticity of where they came from, they like to go back and see how much they can draw from the commonality of the first three based on what was called Q. But in reality, none of them were really written by the names of the people that they use. So Matthew was not a companion of the prophet Jesus or Luke or any of these? Well, okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are made up names. Made up. Yeah. There's the possibility that John is uh, real because of the reference within the text itself. But when we start talking about <laughs> the, the names that are on there, the, this uh, it's just some way for them to keep up with it, to denote that we're talking about this particular book or that book. You might also consider the, the rest of the New Testament when you talk about the Corinthian letters, the Romans, uh, Hebrews and so on because what's happening here these letters were ri uh, written to pr particular churches and bishops and then sent to them were maintained there for instance uh, 1st Corinthians and 2nd Corinthians means the first letter came that's the first so-called book then the second letter comes that's the second uh, book and these are going to be instructions that are written to them by someone well, we really don't know who wrote it. We don't know who wrote the letter to him to start with to tell him the story. But if you're living in that time, at that place, and that's your church, and you go there, this is the book they refer to. They don't have the whole Bible, not in those days. They would have, you know, perhaps if they had been Jewish, they would have, but for the converts, they would just have this letter, or the second letter, and then later these were compiled together, but much later. As, as a matter of fact, the Bible as we know it today, uh, the Catholic Bible is coming from the Council of Nicaea, which was in 325 A.D., or the Christian era, as we say. And at that time, there were more than 200 books. And there was quite a discrepancy over that, and it was decided at the Council is that they would accept only these 73 books. There were 73 at that time. 
Then later the church took out the last book, which is called the Book of Revelations. Then this was put back in at another council meeting, taken back out at another council meeting over the centuries. Now, as far as the Bible that's known to the Protestant Christians today, perhaps some of them know this, that are, even from the layman, that this Bible is really a diminished version of the Catholic Bible. The Catholic Bible having a total of 73, as we mentioned, but this one has only 70, uh, 66 books in it. 66 books. So what happened to the other seven books? Well, part of those books were put into other chapters. Some things were taken out. There were some things added that had never been in the Bible before. Now, one of the things, for instance, in just to give you an example, there are three separate letters attributed to someone named John. Not John of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but some other John. And that's John 1, John 2, John 3. In John 1, there is a verse in chapter 5, verse 7, and it says in here that uh, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and these three are one. This is an interpolation which was added only in the la within the last, uh, we might say, six or seven hundred years. It was based on the verse that comes after it, and so they inserted an extra verse in there and uh, tried to make it appear as though that was a part of the Bible, and it wasn't. The, the, ber the verse they took it from actually says there are three that bear witness in heaven, okay? The Father, the Blood, and the Spirit. And there's no word Son here, it's Father, Blood, and Spirit, and these three agree. It doesn't say they're one, it said they agree. And so that gives you an example of one of the things that, now, if you look to the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark in the very last chapter, which is chapter 16, you'll, you'll notice that, and if you have a revised standard version or something, there'll be some footnotes in there. The oldest manuscripts only go up to verse 9, they stop. Verses 9, 10, 11, these are added by someone, and they don't know who added these verses. And another version has verses that go all up to, way to 22. Who added those verses? They don't know. So you get an extra 13 verses, or an extra 3 verses, or just let it stop where it originally did, and you got choices to make. The best authorities on the Bible, the ancient manuscripts, have all concluded unanimously, there's no difference of opinion, that they don't really know exactly what any of the books were in their original form. But they can get pretty close, and they can understand that there were teachings that were pretty similar. So we covered, uh, how many books total in the New Testament? Well, it depends on if you have the, the Protestant, Protestant Bible. In, in the Protestant Bible, we have today uh, 27. 27, four of which are the Synoptic Gospels? No, no, three are Synoptic. So, and what's John? John is the, just called the John. Just John, Gospel. okay. So we cleared this up that those names are conveniently given to those books. We don't know who the authors are, is that true? Well, I didn't say conveniently given, but no, we don't know who the authors are. These were given to give a personal flavor for the, the reading, because if you just said this is Q, and this is Z, and this is Y, or this is Alpha, and this is Beta, it didn't have the, the ring that they were looking for to keep the, the, the uh, priests uh, focused on what they were. So bottom line, these weren't any of the companions of Jesus, peace be upon him, writing these books. We just want to make this fact clear. Is this true or not? That's well established. I mean, okay, by who, by, by who? So the audience knows that we're not coming from a bias. What sources can they go to to verify this? Well, of course you can go to any of the scholars who have uh, worked on the archaeological finds of the Bible, those who work with the manuscripts uh, for centuries. Well, today there would be Bart Aaron. I would say that he would be one of the top experts. And uh, certainly he's very critical on the text. Uh, I would recommend uh, his books. He's written The Lost Scriptures, Misquoting Jesus and Lost Christianities. His three books are very famous right now, and they're in current. You can get them at the uh, local bookstores. Uh, another one that you might be interested in, one who is not uh, uh, attacking or being uh, extra critical, but still he is a good scholar, and this is F.F. Uh, F. Bruce. And although a very confirmed Christian, he admits as well that the English translations have many, many changes. He says in his books that the first 
retranslation translation of the famous book we refer to as King James Version. He said it, it was, as you probably know, in 1611 A.D. The first retranslation had to be the very next year because it had some very serious mistakes. Now, one of which was a reference to uh, a good lady as a prostitute. That was a mistake, and they had to fix that. That was in 1611 mm -hmm. to 1612, the first year. 1613, another translation, etc., etc. He gives a list of the many different retranslations they did in the first and second centuries in his book, A History of the Translations of the uh, Bible to the English Language. I think that's the full title of it. And uh, then the, if you want to go to some of the Old Testament scholars and see what they've said as well, you can look for um, Dr. Richard Elliot Friedman in his book, Who Wrote the Bible. You can also look to uh, a number of others. Uh, I would re refer also to, uh, go ahead. That's fine. We, w we want to move on from here. We have we covered the four. They can go and look at these r resources you mentioned. Now that brings us down to 23. Who wrote the rest? If you can name a few of the books that come after this, and who are the supposed authors of these books? Yeah. Well, uh, what we're talking about the references. I, I should also mention there's a website called BibleIslam.com, which is a, a reference site where you can go and get a lot of information. Do you work for Bar Aaron or any of these people? Are you making some <laughs> proceeds? Uh, <laughs> No, no. I have emailed him back and forth and tried to encourage him to visit with us and talk with us, but he wasn't really interested in it. However, uh, the website, Bible Islam, you can find a lot of reference material there and do, you do some study on your own. Uh, as far as some of the other books, after the first Gospels, the very first thing that comes is called the uh, Acts of the Apostles. That's the name of the book, Acts, the Book of Acts or Acts of the Apostles. This is also attributed to the same author of the book of Luke. They say whoever wrote Luke is probably the one who also wrote the Acts of the Apostles because whoever it was, he had a lot of access and knowledge about the person named Paul or Saul. And his you know, carryings on, his, whatever he did, his history and so on is uh, accounted for here. And in chapters, um, chapters 7 or 9 and 24, Four and twenty-six. There, there's an account here, if you will. Uh, I don't have it in front of my mind right now, but the accounts of how Paul originally got his revelation when he was on his road to Damascus and when he was carrying the papers to Damascus to be able to per legally persecute anybody who had left their form of Judaism to this new thing called Christianity. And in fact, it wasn't even called Christianity yet. He says in, an, in another book they wrote, he says that they were never called Christians until they went to Antioch. Well, the, he calls them people of the way. So people of the way, he was on his way to, to uh, serve papers to the government there to show that they had permission to grab these people, put them in chains, drag them back, torture them, punish them, kill them. He said that himself in the text. So, uh, no, Paul didn't know him. Uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, he didn't know uh, any first-hand account. He knew second-hand accounts from people who had known Jesus. But originally, as I said, he was killing those people. He wasn't listening to them for guidance. He was uh, making uh, fun of them or, you know, destroying them. As far as the Acts of the Apostles go, it, it is really uh, disputable about who actually wrote it. But it may be that the same author is the one who wrote Luke. Now, there's another book called Hebrews. In Hebrews, it appears whoever wrote this was writing to the Hebrews in particular, or the children of Israel, to try to uh, justify what's going on and make it uh, uh, compatible to what their teachings are. To We're almost running out of time. We want to just continue on we covered five so far you have uh, after uh, John you have uh, Luke no after Acts of the Apostle Hebrews for the rest of the 22 or 21 who wrote these are these all the rest from Paul or anonymous authors well there's the book of Romans for instance and in Romans this is uh, supposedly written to the the um, what we would call Mushrikeen or the pagans who were not uh, from the Jewish background. And so it is trying now to present things in a way that they would understand it according to their, you know, ideologies and so on. 
Then you have the first and second Corinthian letters. And these are a good example of letters that are written to churches. Uh, a bishop might write a letter to a church and send it out. It would be rather large. And this is why they're called books that it has chapters in it. And then after a period of time, they would write another one to them. And this would be the second one. And that's why they would say first Corinthians, second Corinthians. And in here, there would be a lot of inspirational things that they would uh, tell them to think about this, consider that, or some of the... Mostly from Saul, you find a cancellation of the basic Torah, the Torah itself, meaning the Old Testament to us. Uh, he is saying that these laws, the many, and there are more than 200 commandments, direct commandments, not just 10, and he's saying that because of these laws, that he's a sinner. If it weren't for these laws, he wouldn't be a sinner. He says, therefore, I'm dead to the law. The law is dead to me. This is a direct contradiction, by the way, to whoever wrote the book of Matthew, because in chapter 5, 17, they're saying that they have a quote from Jesus himself saying that I came not to destroy the law. Not to destroy the law, nor the teachings of the prophets. He said, rather, I came to fulfill and uh, he goes on to say that if anybody even, the, he says that not even the least dot or tittle or the smallest uh, letter from the alphabet of the law will be in any wise lessened. But if anybody breaks any of these commandments and teaches this, that it's okay, then he's going to be the least in the kingdom in the next life. But whoever keeps these commandments and uh, uh, teaches that, he'll be the highest in the kingdom. Then it goes on, whoever it was, had a thing in for the Sanhedrin because he goes right straight to the Pharisees and, and he says it right here. It says, and unless your righteousness exceeds that of these Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom. So we see a direct... Uh, but as we will discover, as we discover more and more about the history of the person so-called Saul or Paul, he did have a, a vendetta against the Pharisees because they had turned him down, kicked him out, basically. His papers to go to Damascus were his last chance. And uh, they said, when you're done, you're finished, because the leader, the chief of the Sanhedrin, the high priest, had a beautiful daughter named Popeia. Paul, is, or Saul then, is engaged to her, but because of his uh, ways, his manners, and his appearance, it was, uh, it was said that he was rather ugly, had a hunched back or a crouched uh, st uh, stance, and that she, not only did she run away from her father, she ran away from the synagogue and uh, the religion itself, and uh, was known to be a wife or a, a, at least a concubine of the Caesar at that time, and it was said that she was in plays on stage and things like this, totally against all the things, the teachings of the, the Hebrew scripture. <laughs> so the father of her is not impressed with Paul anymore at all, or Saul, and is basically told him, no, you're not going to ever have a chance to be on our uh, Sanhedrin, our board of directors, if you will, and you're never going to have a chance to go anywhere with uh, Judaism, you're finished, you're out. I think that's the way they tell the stories. And these are stories. I, we can't confirm uh, a lot of it. We can, what we confirm, though, is Popeya herself. It is well known that she was a Jewish and that she had left their religion and left her father, who was the high priest, and that she had gone over to the Caesar. That's historical fact. Well, we want to know, the audience wants to know, a sincere person who really wants to examine the evidence. From these 27 books, is there anybody that we can bring forward and examine their testimony? Are they receiving these revelations from God? Are they getting inspired by God? It, because the majority of people, as I'm understanding it, these books are anonymous. Is there any one of them that we can bring forward and examine? Witness. Like you would in a court of law. I understand what you're saying. This is not even the intent of what people are saying. The, the, the scholars of the Bible are not trying to say that they've got an author for any particular one. What they're saying is that they know that the fact that they have enough different versions that there must have been an original. That's what they conclude. So they're just trying to determine what must have been the original and why changes were made and who made them. And that is what is called the, the, um, the criticism that they have or the way that the, the apologetics uh, deal with it. What I would say
doing your best, you know, this, this seems very much in line with what Islam teaches and you do have that in the New Testament. On the other hand, if you have a person who never really met Jesus and he never really uh, had a proper attitude from the beginning, his attitude is one of destroying Christianity or people of the way and his idea of even persecuting them to death, which he claims he did, then all of a sudden having a blinding light revelation and just that alone is enough for him to convert to this new thing that he's come up with and he's all of a sudden in charge of it. Well, that's pretty good concern. He just lost his job, you know. So is that a motive? Well, I would say that it would be a pretty strong one. That and the fact that he's no longer having his uh, fiancée, Popeye, she's gone out of the picture. His intended father-in-law, who is the the high priest is basically saying you're out we don't need you that would be a motivator uh, the idea that he has these mystic things from the beginning he is actually a product of Tarsus and a mystic religion they had then so this may be some of the his motivators that in like enjoying being in charge given the orders and so on it, it all of this could be and then it could be that uh, all of its uh, bogus it could be that these are things made up by other people because when you don't know who the author is if you don't if you can't point to somebody and say he wrote it okay let's ask him why he did it then you don't really know now we don't want the people to lose hope because there is a man that is claiming he's receiving revelations from God he's a man that you can bring and examine his whole life can we talk about this man and the message that has come for the whole of mankind well, you're talking about Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi peace be upon him. And certainly we will be happy to talk about him. Number one, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a cousin to Jesus, peace be upon him. They are cousins by way of Abraham. Abraham has the two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. From Isaac comes the long line of the children of Israel. And from Ishmael is coming the what they call the Arab religion, uh, which originally was no difference than the religion of Isaac. But it became corrupted over the centuries by the Arabs themselves, and paganism crept in and began to take over. And a lot of the rituals that had originally been ascribed to Abraham became corrupted. So when Muhammad was born, he was different from the rest of the people. One of the things that's very impressive about it is that he never lied, so much so that they gave him the title of the truthful person. They call him a Sadiq. Another thing was that if he was given any trust, he never broke the trust. Any promises he gave, he had fulfilled his promises. So he was highly respected, highly regarded, and he was someone that also joined the, the ties of kinship amongst the people to help them uh, fix their differences amongst families, amongst tribes, and so on, to end wars and brutal and bitter feuds that they had going on. So he was highly respected, and he was the son of uh, one of the tribal uh, members who were successors. Mm -hmm. And when the grandfather would die to take over all of Mecca and all the religious uh, paraphernalia, etc., it goes along with that for all of Arabia. His grandfather was the chief, the main one. So he had a very high position, but he didn't regard that as, as something to make him better than anybody else. In fact, he was very, very humble, and uh, he liked to worship away from these people in their false worship. He would just go off in a cave fasting and pray and not have any beads with him, not have any statues with him, not have any pictures or images or anything. He detested all that, which is very similar. You know, if you go back and look at the Maccabeans of the Old Testament, you'll find they were the same way. This is exactly how they were. And if somebody wants to really study the life of Muhammad Sallallahu they will find that he is truly an amazing man, but, but he was a man. He wasn't like a god, a demagogue, a son of a god, or anything else, but he did do some amazing things in a very short period of time to reorganize some very disorganized tribes, to bring together a, a harmony and a peace between tribes of the Arabian Peninsula, and unite them in such a way that the people had to respect this new way of life, this way called the Deen al-Islam. And it, it, it's amazing because so many people would be affected by watching the positiveness and seeing the results of believing in one God and obeying Him and following Muhammad. To the extent that it became 
uh, uh, spread all the way out into Spain to the far west and all the way to China in the far east. And uh, this is in itself a reason why we should explore and learn more. Who is this man, Muhammad? Now that we have a website, Muhammad A to Z. This will give you a good chance to learn more about what other people said about him what non-Muslims said, what his enemies said, what his friends said, his companions, his wives, what did they say? And especially what did Allah say about him in the Quran? I think that this would be probably a topic for an entire program or series maybe. I want you to tell me what a ruler at that time said, Heraclius. Heraclius. Yeah, his name was Heraclius. And Heraclius was the Roman leader at that time. And he was uh, this is some. Here's a case where his own enemies, relatives, tribal relatives, were doing business uh, in this city, and Heraclius knew that there was a letter coming to him in the Arabic language. He didn't read Arabic, so he said, "Bring me these merchants over here that are from that area." They said, "Do you know this man?" Well, <laughs> they were relatives. In fact, they were pagan worshippers, and they didn't like worshiping one god, so they were against Muhammad. And he said, uh, Heraclius said to him, I want you guys to give translation of this, but first I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay, tell me about this man, Muhammad. And he listened to the answers. He said, did, did this man want to be a king? Was anybody a king in his family? And no, it's not, it's not like that. Well, did this man ever want to have some kind of glory? Did he claim some kind of thing in the past? And the, the, you read the whole story. At the end of it, it he concluded this man is, uh, it sounds very good. It sounds like an upright man. Now read me the letter. Because I want to know who he is before I read it. Well, it's too bad we don't do that today because if you said, well, I would need to know who the author is before I read, then you would find a lot of people understanding religion a whole lot better. But in any case, they said, well, it's a letter. It said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Uh, and uh, this is Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, writing to you to call you to the worship of the one true God and, and serving him. And if you do that, then all your people will follow you, will have the reward of this. Um, but if you refuse, then you'll have that to deal with on the Day of Judgment. But he's calling him to worship one God and join us in this beautiful way of life as Muslims. This is what he's calling the Heraclius, the leader of the Romans, too. And Heraclius tested his people by saying, uh, what do you think if I accept? He First he had them go lock all the doors. And he said, what do you guys think if I accept this? Uh, and uh, we become Muslims. And man, they went mad. They started going crazy. And they said, no, we worship you. They worship him. And he said, okay, okay, let it go at that. That's what we'll go with then. I'm giving you a brief translation of what it was, but to let you know that, that, that Heraclius himself was very impressed with what Muhammad. And many other people have been impressed. And we can do another whole show on this. I'd like you to give some closing comments and suggestions for the sincere truth seeker who's been enlightened by this talk that we've just had. Well, first of all, I, I don't want anybody to just take my word for anything. We spend our lives studying and reading, and like I know you have too. What we encourage people to do is to seek information that's from reliable sources. That's number one. Trust the the author based on his credibility, not just because you like him or you like his style or something like that or the way he combs his hair, but rather what is his sources, how reliable is he, and then read slowly and with an open heart, open mind, and understand where people are coming from with what they're writing. And it could be very good. It's, it happened to me. I used to, of course, as a, a music minister and preacher in Christianity, I was very sold on what I had until I began to really explore the sources and came to the conclusion that Islam is something even better for me. Well, I thank you for being with us today. May God Almighty Allah, the Creator of the Heavens and Earth, reward you. Jazakallah khaira, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. That was this week's episode of The Dean Show. Thank you for tuning in. Tune in every week where I bring you a new episode. You can visit us at thedeanshow.com. You can book Yusuf Estes at islamevents.com. And until next time, we'll see you. Assalamu alaikum, which peace be unto you.